Okay, welcome back, brothers and sisters. Shall we begin again with a word of prayer? Amen. So, we have been working our way through the, the line of the three decrees, and we've got up to the point where we're now, where Artaxerxes has put the third decree in place. And the last thing we were marking was that this decree here marks the beginning of the 2300 years and the beginning of the 70 weeks. Okay, and that's important. And we'll see that when we, we come on to the next two lines, why that's important. And it really brings these whole thoughts together and many principles about God. Now, let's go now to the book of Haggai, chapter 2. Verse 9 it says, The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, the natural demonstrates the spiritual, right? And it's no accident that they use words like latter and former. So the former house, what's it speaking about? What was the former house in the book of Haggai? The, uh, Solomon's. Solomon's temple, right? Which we, it was God's temple, but Solomon was the one behind building it, right? And it says, The glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of Solomon's temple. But when the, the second temple was built, was it more glorious to look at? No. No, but wh why is it saying that it would be more glorious? Because Christ, was. because Christ was coming. Christ was going to be in that temple, right? So <laughs> the fulfillment of all prophecy is pointed to this particular prophecy. <coughs> Christ in you, the hope of glory. Because you are the temple, right? So the former house is represent the former reign. Solomon's temple was a type pointing down to the ladder house, at the ladder reign, when Christ will be in you, the hope of glory. This is the temple that the Lord wants to build, right? This is the temple in Ezekiel's book that was never built. This is the temple that it's speaking about. It's us that he's trying to rebuild through these messages, right? To cleanse us of all unrighteousness so that he can come and dwell in us. So when he dwells in us, the glory of the latter house will be more glorious than the former, right? That's all prophecies pointing down to that, right? So, but here, in, in this, um, this time period, that this was the prophecy they went for. The glorious, the, sorry, the glories of this ladder house when it's built right here says it's finished at the third step. This is when they go forth now to minister in the temple. It's marking God's glory. It's marking the time period of the ladder reign. Former reign, ladder reign. But under the ladder reign, what happens? Former ladder, right? We're going to see this over and over, right? 
So it's pointed down to this temple when it's going to be built, how it's going to be more glorious than, than the former, right? Yes, the angel of Revelation 18. This is what Patrick was pointing to. The angel of Revelation 18 marks the third step because under the third step, all three messages are blended and combined in the third, right? And those people, right there, you're going to demonstrate God's character, whether or not you know him or whether or not you don't know him, right? If you what, sorry? I'm saying in that period, it's when Christ said, if I be lifted up. Yes. Then all men will be drawn unto me, right? And this is the time period of the cross, and we're going to, sh we're going to show that, right? So, if you jump down in Haggai to verse 21, it says, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth. Where's the heavens and the earth shaken? And here, right? This was where I've just put this because we haven't got room to write it. I'll put H and E, heavens and earth, right? And let me just rub this off here. I can put um, 70 weeks and 2300. And it's marking here the heaven and the earth, right? So. <coughs> I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. So he's talking about right here. When he shakes the heaven and the earth, he's going to overthrow kingdoms. Now we're going to see how this is brought to pass when we come down to our line. And I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen. And I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them. And the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, I will take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and I will make thee as a signet. For I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Many are called, but... Few are chosen. So this represents the few that are chosen. He says he's going to make you a signet. What is a signet? It's a sign, right? He's going to lift you up before all the nations of the earth, right? And it's marking where the heavens and the earth are shaking. He's going to overthrow kingdoms. We, we will really nail that in place, right? So the structure, the structure of a line helps us to know where to place symbols. Right, we've got to de we've got to rightly we've got to discern between good and evil. We've got to rightly divide God's word. Now, in Daniel nine twenty five, Daniel nine twenty five, because this is marking the beginning of the seventy weeks. <coughs> It says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So what I want you to see here is that there's different fractals. The Lord has given us this 70-week prophecy. It takes you down to the time of Christ, right? But... In that, there are fractals. There's this 49 weeks, 7 times 7, right? So, it begins here. So, the first fractal we want to see is this 49 weeks, right? 49 uh, years, which is 7 uh, times 7 weeks, right? 7 times 7 years, which is 49. Now, and I want, to, I want us to see this because... Go to Leviticus 25. In Leviticus 25, verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> it says, And thou shalt number seven 
Sabbaths of years unto thee. Seven times seven years. That's 49 years. Then thou shalt cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound. On the tenth day of the seventh month and the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. Now we're going to come to this, this times, right? I'm going to show you when we get down to the Millerite line, we're going to do a real nice show about all these, an explanation of the time right here. Very, very interesting. But what I want you to see is that the end of this 49th year was on the Day of Atonement. It's not based upon Jewish years from spring to spring. It's based upon the agricultural cycle. And I'll show you that, right? So this, it's marking 49 years. And when you get to the Day of Atonement, what day is the Day of Atonement on in the Millerite history? Which is the third way mark, right? Okay. And in here, you have the third way mark. Because under the third, all three repeat, right? And you, you will, I'll show you that this is also October 22nd, right? So the point is that I'm trying to make here that this 49 takes you to the Day of Atonement. And from the Day of Atonement forward, it's now the 50th, right? We have here, Matt, the 50th, right? So this 49, which is marking this period, the 7 times 7 leads you to this 50th. Now, I don't expect you to understand that at this moment, right? These are just symbols, so don't look at me so confused, right? The, it's marking here from the going forth of the commandment, the 70 weeks. Now remember, what this is trying to show us is that from here to here, the messages come in their order. You get down to the third and all three repeat, but they repeat not in order. They are one message and they come and they parallel each other, right? So when you get this prophecy at the end of the world, it's not talking about time because after October 22nd, 1844, time is no longer. So you have this prophecy going from 457 to uh, AD 34 when it ends, right? It's split into portions, and God is dividing it for us, right? So there's this 49, and then there's this um, 483 years, right? Which is the, that's the 62 weeks, and then there's the last week, right? Which is seven, right? It's split into fractals, okay? So this already teaches you, so you're not trying to apply this in a chronological fashion, right? Because the time is no longer. These are symbols. So the first symbol we're going to look at from 457 is 49, right? So when you get to his 457, boom, we put the 49 in there. So the Bible it interprets itself. So when you go to Leviticus 25, it's marking these 49 years and it leads you to the 50th. And you can show that it's teaching the same thing. That's what I'm saying. As we go on further, we will show you why that's important. Because they had to count that from the moment they came into the land. Right? Where do you come out of Egypt? After the fall of Egypt. <laughs> no. Here. Right? Remember when we were in this line, it's right here. This is the, the place where they crossed... The, the Red Sea, right? So when they cross the Red Sea, they're, they're, it's marking their deliverance, right? M many, many things. You have to understand many things, but in some sense, this is the former rain, this is the latter rain. The latter rain is the rest. It's the refreshing. It's the entering into the promised land, right? So in some sense, you're entering into the promised land when you come into the third step. But under the third step, you've got to have this final test. So the true entering in is right here, but it's still typified here. You, you'll see this more when we go through, right? So in Leviticus 25, it's marking the point where they've now entered into the land. And the command is when you enter into the land, you've got to keep seven cycles of seven, which is this 49, this fractal here. And the 49 
And then it says, when you get to the end of the 49, it's now the 50th. It's marking the Jubilee, which is 50. 50, right? You're going to see this at every Waymar we do down here. There's this Pentecost uh, mar there. So, many things we have to unlearn, and many things we have to learn, right? Only the Lord can really uh, may help you to understand these things. But by God's grace, we will get there. Now it says in verse 9, Then thou shalt cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound. What sounded at Mount Sinai? The trumpet, right? So there's all these symbols there that's confirming these things for us, right? Now, in the book of Ezekiel, when he says, go take this message to the house of Israel, right? He says, I'm not sending you to a people of a strange language that won't understand what you're saying. I'm sending you to the house of Israel. But what does Isaiah say about the house of Israel? They got ears to hear, but they can't hear. They got eyes to see, but they're blind. This is our condition, right? We don't know God's voice, and we can't see the things in his word because we have been brought up in Babylon, right? We are the, we are the mystery of iniquity. We have the seed mingled because we read God's word, but as soon as we walk outside our door, what do we get bombarded with? The neighbor's boogie box blasting some pop songs at us, right? And all this advertisement, TV, fashion, all this garbage, right, that draws our mind away from God. And we're constantly at a war to try and keep our minds on holy things, right? And it's hard to do that when you're in the world, but not being of the world. So the Lord has to bring us out of there to clean us up, right? So he has to bring us through this, and then he brings us out of Egypt, in some sense, to put us through this last test. And it's the final cleansing to bring you into the Holy Land, right? You, you'll see it. It'll, it'll, all come, it'll all come together. So, <clears throat> Nehemiah, right? If we go to the book of Nehemiah, verse, chapter 1 and verse 1. The book of Nehemiah is now about this decree, this decree that's given by Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes repeats his decree. It's not another decree. He's just repeating the very decree that he gave. Now, this is something you need to understand, and we're going to show this when we get down to the Millerite history. Cyrus arrived here, but Cyrus gets confirmed here, right? There's always this teaching, a message arrives, then it gets confirmed. A message arrives, gets confirmed. A message arrives, gets confirmed. But what confirms the third angel's message is itself. It's the angel of Revelation 18. The angel of Revelation 18 is not another message. It's not a fourth angel, as people have been calling it. It's the same angel. It's just a, it's the message that empowers itself, right? The angel of Revelation 18 is the third angel's message, and it empowers the third angel's message. Okay? So, what we'll see as we go through there is that the second empowers the first, the third empowers the second, but it's the angel of Revelation 18 that empowers the third. And it is the angel of, it is the third angel, right? It's just the empowerment of the third angel. And we'll show you that. So, this message right here that we're going to read about in Nehemiah, Nehemiah is getting a confirmation from Artaxerxes on the decree that he made right here. So it's like it's, it's marking the angel of Revelation 18, and we'll prove that as we go through. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hachaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the palace. What does Shushan mean? It means trumpet, right? And there's only three places where Shushan's in the Bible. The book of Esther, and then Shushan the palace, and it's about the Sunday law, right? 
And then in Daniel chapter 8, right? And we'll cover Daniel 8 later on in the week. We'll show they're all marking the same thing. <clears throat> that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and the certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. They said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction. So, under the command of Daniel 9 and verse 25, it says, They shall rebuild the streets and walls in troublous times. So, although the third decree had gone forward, they go up to do that, to get the temple running again, and they become under great affliction. Right? So Nehemiah is now receiving this, this message about his people that have gone up to, to, to work the temple. They're now under great affliction. <clears throat> um, it says, The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept, and mourned certain days, and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So what is this teaching us? It's teaching us that although you get to the third decree and it says the temple is finished, the streets and walls are not built. So it's not finished because it brings them into great affliction. They can't protect themselves. What protects us? The wall. What's the wall? The law. The, yes, the law. The, 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 the marriage and the law. No, it's true. It's correct, right? These are the, the laws that protect us. We're going to show why these two things have to be in place. So the decree that begins at 457, which is marked on October 22nd, E44, which we'll show you, there's still a work to be done. They have to rebuild the walls and the streets. And the streets is their old paths, right? So they have to rebuild the old paths and the streets... And the walls in troublous times. What's the troublous times pointing to? The what? Persecution. Yes, persecution. But which time is it pointing to? What's this? What's it? They're all talking about the end of the world. What's at the end of the world? What's what's the persecution? The the Sunday law, right? The Sunday law, when it comes, where are we going to get persecuted, right? We're going to lay this out. Very, very nice. Okay. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house. So what's Nehemiah doing? He's, it's marking from this time forward, the streets and walls need to be rebuilt, and he goes before the king, and he, sorry, he hears this message, and he's now praying and fasting and confessing his sins and the sins of his fathers. Right? That's the same as Daniel does. And said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear... Now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses." Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out into the uttermost parts of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them into the place that I have chosen to set my name there. 
Now these are the servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by the great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name. And prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cup bearer. So Nehemiah, from this time forward, he's fasting and praying. He's confessing, let's just write it here, confessing sin. He's confessing sin, and it says that he is the king's cupbearer, right? Very important. Yes? What did the cup bearer? Means that he, he is like a butler. He, he stands before the king with the cup, and he is the one that's, that's responsible for giving the king the wine cup. Okay? What's a wine cup symbolized in Bible prophecy? What's the third angel's message say? If any man worship the beast in his image, he should, yeah, he should drink of the, the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, right? We're going to see the importance of understanding this symbol that Nehemiah represents somebody who's going to give the king a cup, right? He's the cup bearer, and the cup represents the third angel's message, right? So, um, he's marked right here as being a cupbearer. He's fa- praying and fasting and confessing his sins, right? So this is a fractal that, that we need to see. Something is happening in this time. Now you go to Nehemiah chapter 2, okay? We're not applying it in a chronolog- chronological order. We're going to bring it back now. And now he's standing before the, the king at at point A, right? He's standing here. Because we're going to see that God's people stand before the kings at different points throughout this history. And it means different things. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 1. It came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad, when the king, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the king and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the king of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, The queen also said in by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let, let us be given, me, be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come unto Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house and for the wall of the city, for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. So he gets given a letter. And this letter is a confirmation to the decree that's already been given. And this letter was a... um, And it was written, he could have all these things to go and do this work. So when an angel comes down, is there a work to do? Yes, when the angel of Revelation 18 comes down, it's marking the third step. And there is a work. And you've got to rebuild the streets and walls in troublous times. Okay? Now, it says here in verse 6, they ask him, how long shall thy journey be? And then he sets a time. And we're going to see this, that prophetically speaking, the prophets ask the question, 
how long? There's always this question asked here, how long? And then there's this time set. Now, and we're going to see that Daniel also asked for time, right? So it's, it's just talking about this, this time period here, prophetically speaking. Um, <clears throat> So he's given this letter, which is a confirmation to the decree. It's just typifying the angel of Revelation 18 that's going to confirm the third angel's message. We'll prove that, of course. I don't expect you just to believe it because I say it. Now, in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 10, it says, When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, so you've got this, um, the Horonites and the Ammonites heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. And in verse 18 it says, Then I told them of the land, of, sorry, then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's word that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? So you've got three enemies here. Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. And they, they are mocking them, and he says they're accusing them of rebelling against the king. Did we not see that already? Did we not see enemies coming against them here and saying you're rebelling against the king? You can see how all these are just types of what's going to happen here, and this is just a repeating here now, and under the third, because under the third, all three repeat. Okay? Um, then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us, therefore we his servants will arise and build. But ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. So he's saying, you've got nothing to do with this work or the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So it's, it's showing you this parallel truth. Okay, now there's much we could lay in this history, but I'm not going to go too much into all the ins and outs of the time of Nehemiah. It's really a huge study. But just like here, once this, this time period was done, this is on about how Nehemiah was going to rebuild the streets and walls in troublous times. And, and, he, and he completes this work here. But we see that in this time period when, when they did this work here, which was marking number 46, the building of God's temple, right? It's the house that God wants to live in. This is what this work is all about here. That they were plagued with plagues, those that had rebelled. And we're going to see the same thing here. In Zechariah chapter 14, because we read that all this was done under the prophesying of Haggai, in Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 12 it says, And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet and their eyes shall consume away in their holes and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. And they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. And so shall be the plague of the horse, of the mule, of the camel, and of the ass, and of all the beasts that shall be in these tents as this plague. So what's, what are symbols of the mule, the horse, the camel, and the ass? What do they represent? Islam, right? 
So these plagues are li linked to Islam. Um, and then it says in verse 17, And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king of the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So right here we marked a time where there was a, an abundance of rain. Pentecost marks an abundance of rain. But here it's saying for these people that don't come up to worship, there's going to be no rain. So one group gets the rain, the other group gets no rain. Okay, this, there's always a famine upon those that, that rebel against God. There's always a great outpouring upon those that obey him. Um, and in verse 19 it says this shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles and I'm going to show you and prove to you that the feast of tabernacles is right here so the plagues come upon all the nations that refuse to come and keep the tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles, and it's likened by the horse, the mule, the camel, and the ass, which are symbols of Islam. So you've got plagues, and I'm just going to put Islam Martin there, right? Okay, it's a strange way of studying the Bible, right? And these are strange things to us. But God is teaching us the same thing over and over. You just have to have your mind opened. And you, you, I guarantee you will, you will get this. Right? As we go down through these lines, you will start to see how everything fits into place. You've just got to understand what it says in Hebrews chapter 5. You have to have your senses exercised to discern between good and evil. What does it mean to have your senses exercised? You've got to practice, right? You've got to practice rightly dividing God's word. And therefore you will be able to discern. No, 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 that can't be. That, that's not teaching it because it's all based upon God's principles. His principles is he's the God that changes not. He deals with man ever the same. Line upon line. He's the pattern man. Right? He shows you these patterns based upon these histories. You've got to rightly divide it and show how these things fit into place. Okay? It won't come in a day, right? By the end of two weeks, our eyes will start to open and we will see these things. Okay. I have finished the remainder. What, what time was that? Part? Oh. We was quick. So we can finish in time for lunch. Shall we close with a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I realize that this, these things are, are difficult. Um, your reform lines are beautiful, Lord. The, when you, when you go from the time of the end through to the third step, everything's nice and in and, and, and an orderly fashion and it's easy to see. But when we get to the third step, Lord, it's, it's hard for us to, to work out how to do these things, to rightly divide your word, to discern what to put there and what not to put there. And I pray that you'll really open our minds and help us to know that the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So please reveal your secret things. Please help us to understand. Please help us to see according to thy will, because it's not human intellect that allows us to see these things, because it's foolishness to the world, but it's spiritually discerned by allowing Scripture to teach us through the aid of the Holy Spirit. And I pray... Dear Father, that you send your Holy Spirit that we might see and understand the wondrous things in thy law, the great and the mighty things that we know not. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.